Earth's water, resupplying the International Space Station, and our administrator testifies about the agency's proposed budget. A few of the stories to tell you about this week at NASA. And liftoff of GRACE follow-on. The twin satellites for the GRACE follow-on, or GRACE FO mission, launched May 22nd from California's Vandenberg Air Force Base. A joint mission with the German Research Center for Geosciences, GRACE FO will observe the continuous movement of water and other changes in Earth's mass on and beneath the planet's surface to help us better understand our planet. This mission will continue the work of the original GRACE mission, which ended science operations in October 2017. GRACE FO launched on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket with five Iridium Next communications satellites as part of a commercial rideshare arrangement. Orbital ATK's Cygnus cargo spacecraft arrived at the International Space Station May 24th with about 7,400 pounds of equipment, cargo, and supplies to support dozens of the more than 250 investigations underway on the orbital laboratory. The Cygnus, which launched three days earlier from our Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia, also delivered new experiments ranging from investigations on emergency navigation to ultra-cold atom research. This is Orbital ATK's ninth contracted cargo resupply mission to the station. On May 23rd, our administrator Jim Bridenstine testified before the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, Science and Related Agencies about the fiscal year 2019 funding request and budget justification for NASA. Getting back to the moon uh, with soft landings for the purpose of an eventual human return to the moon uh, is the objective to establish American leadership and utilize resources of the moon to ultimately take us to Mars and beyond. The president's request of almost $20 billion for NASA provides resources to advance exploration of the moon and deep space and pursue the cutting edge science and aeronautics technology breakthroughs at the core of our mission. The names of more than 1.1 million Earthlings will travel aboard our Parker Solar Probe on its upcoming mission to travel closer to our sun than any spacecraft ever has before. A memory card with the names is mounted on a plaque dedicated to the mission's namesake, heliophysicist Eugene Parker, who first theorized the existence of the solar wind. The mission is scheduled to launch July 31st from our Kennedy Space Center in Florida. That's what's up this week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, follow us on the web at nasa.gov slash twan. We're back with four awesome discoveries you probably didn't hear about this week. Light them up. Researchers have figured out how to speed up or slow down feeding human heart cells growing in a dish by remote control. Not that kind. They do it with light. These heart cells are growing on graphene. Graphene converts light into electricity. The more intense the light, the faster the cells beat. Unlike some plastic petri dish, the graphene lets the cells behave more like they would in the human body. So stay tuned for light-controlled pacemakers and a whole lot more. People who want to add insects to the human diet may be channeling their distant ancestors. Seems like the dinosaurs got the good grub, while the furry little creatures that scurried around their feet were mostly eating insects. Oh, Mom! Insects again? That conclusion is based not only on fossils, but now on genome analysis of 107 species of mammals whose genes for insect digestive enzymes are still hanging around in nearly all mammal genomes today, including ours. Bugs. It was what's for dinner. At least till the dinosaurs disappeared. Oh, Mom! What's going to be slower, stronger, and a whole lot wetter by the end of the century? Hint we give them proper names. This study compares 22 hurricanes with their future selves if they occurred in the average climate predicted for the end of this century. Hurricane Ike killed 100 people and devastated part of the Gulf back in 2008. In 2098, Ike could be 13% stronger and 34% wetter. In fact, simulations show end of the century hurricanes will dump on average 24% more rain. Biologists report they've transferred a memory from one marine snail to another. 
Using very mild electrical stimulations, a group of snails was taught to lengthen their defensive withdrawal contractions from the normal one second to about 50. When RNA from their nervous systems was injected into a second group of snails, it was as if they had received the stimulations too. Their contractions jumped from one second to about 40. The scientists say the research could lead to new ways to lessen the effects of Alzheimer's or PTSD. And there you go. See you next week with four more awesome discoveries funded by NSF. From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Andrew Robb, and I am Head of Special Format Conservation and Coordinator of the Preservation Emergency Response Team at the Library of Congress. Today, my colleague, Alan Haley, and I will be talking about how we prepare for and respond to emergencies that threaten or damage collections. My name is Alan Haley. I'm a Preservation Specialist in the Conservation Division. The campus of the library consists of three buildings on Capitol Hill, as well as other facilities further away from the center of the city. The three large buildings bear the names of early presidents, Jefferson, Adams, and Madison. The Library of Congress used to be located within the Capitol building itself until the late 19th century, when it was moved to the Jefferson building, built specifically to house the collection. With rapid growth of the library, the Adams building opened in 1931 and the Madison in 1980. Our collections contain more than 120 million items, including books, documents, photographs, as well as musical instruments, maps, globes, and other objects from across the world. The Preservation Directorate at the Library of Congress is responsible for ensuring long-term access to the intellectual content of the collections. This is achieved through a multifaceted approach carried out by four divisions in the library's mass deacidification program. The Conservation Division at the Library of Congress ensures the preservation of the library's special collections by undertaking condition surveys and rehousing projects, conducting condition assessments, basic stabilization, and full treatments. The division also participates in the management of collection storage, exhibitions, loans, digitization, and other projects. Beyond the library, the Conservation Division furthers the field of conservation by hosting advanced conservation internships. These students spend a year with conservation lab staff and are active in research and publishing to complete their graduate education. We have been interested in the topic of disaster preparedness and response since the mid-1990s. We have worked alongside other colleagues in developing strategies and procedures to be used in response and recovery when there is a damaging event, some of which we will introduce in this video. Whether we are talking about large institutions or small ones, all are subject to risk from a variety of threats. For us, water is our biggest threat. Remember, your situation may be different. Here at the Library of Congress, our buildings contain thousands of sprinkler heads as part of our fire prevention system, which we are very thankful for. We also have hundreds of miles of water-bearing pipes and have occasional problems with roof structures and HVAC systems. After trying for many years to identify a secure space we could use for the dedicated purpose of collections recovery, we were finally granted this room, which has become indispensable for us. We call it the Collections Recovery Room. Whenever there is an event that damages collections, we bring those materials to this area on carts. The supplies and equipment we have found most useful in collection salvage are dust masks, cotton rags, wax paper, adhesive tape, nitrile or latex gloves, paper towels, trash bags, a good vacuum with an assortment of attachments, Ziploc bags, goggles, antiseptic wipes, various kinds of absorbent interleaving materials, corrugated board of two thicknesses, E and B, a rack of shelves with fine screen supports to increase circulation of air, which aids in drying large quantities of loose leaf documents. In addition to all of this, we have found this ductless fume hood to be a huge asset to our practices. We use it mostly for mold removal from the surfaces of documents 
once the mold is dried and inactive. Any activity around mold may carry health risks and therefore we use a variety of personal protective gear. Disposable gloves and aprons, a mask and goggles. If your institution does not have a fume hood, you should perform dry mold removal outdoors using soft brushes and cloths. Make sure you perform this procedure well away from other human activity and always wear the same protective gear. We have two freezers which are very useful for items affected by active mold. Freezing will stop the outbreak. The freezers also serve as a quarantine space for items with active mold that are a threat to the rest of the collection, so separating them is necessary. We place the books in Ziploc bags before placing them in the freezer to keep them separate and to keep them from sticking to one another. Freezing is a good option for many water-damaged library materials, especially if the scale of the incident far exceeds your resources to stabilize them. Freezing buys you time to begin recovery at a later date. Freezing can be done on site with household or commercial freezers or by a recovery specialist with access to large freezer space. Freezing can be problematic for some materials such as early glass negatives and parchment or vellum. Your emergency plans should identify those types of very sensitive materials. It's also important to know that modern coated papers, like magazines for example, tend to stick to each other as they dry. Freezing, followed by vacuum freeze drying, may be the best treatment. Salvage is usually not something done by just one person, as there are a number of actions needed to be carried out, such as secure transport of affected materials, documentation of the event, the drying operation, and the monitoring of items. All will require multiple resources. The person who knows the collection best will select items in a type of triage by degree of damage. The groups will be the undamaged, the lightly damaged, the moderately damaged, and the extremely damaged. Those which are found to be unharmed should be separated from the salvage location immediately. In the drying area, it is recommended that you increase the rate of air circulation along with lowering the temperature. In the context of a disaster where the power is out, open windows when possible or identify a secure spot outdoors to carry out the salvage. A specialist must always verify that the water that has affected the collection's materials is clean or dirty. In the case of contaminated water events, one must always wear protective gloves and aprons at a minimum. In the case of our practice today, the water is clean and it's not necessary to wear gloves, but you can wear them if you prefer. The surface we will use as the drying station should be covered in an absorbent material. In the collections recovery room, we usually use blotter paper, but you can also use newsprint, towels, sheets, or other fabric if those materials are more readily available. For this practice salvage, we have selected materials commonly found in libraries, archives, and museums. Books, loose leaf documents, and photographic materials are among those most commonly affected. A recommended first step is to assess the overall extent of the event, which might help you establish first priorities. Drying books that are just slightly wet can be done by standing them upright and fanning out the pages. This will only give a decent result if the book has been wet along the edges and if the binding has not been substantially weakened by water. Air circulation should be light for these books and not directly on them to avoid distortion. For books that are moderately wet or very wet and for books with soft paper covers, it is best to keep them flat while drying. We can use an assortment of materials to interleave the pages, which increases the rate of absorption with the amount of water that the book has absorbed, we cannot stand it upright. We'll place it flat with some sheets of newsprint inserted into the text block every 50 pages or so, and also between each cover and the text block. It's important not to expand the thickness of the book too much with extra material, which would weaken the binding. This soft cover book is completely soaked and definitely cannot be placed upright. In this case, we are using an alternative material for interleaving, a very soft non-woven polyester cellulose material that is several times more absorbent than paper. It can also be reused over and over. Whatever you use to interleave a wet book, it's necessary to change it out at a minimum twice a day until the book is almost dry. 
A weight on top of a wet book may also minimize the swelling and distortion during the drying process. Another method we use to dry books when we have many affected at the same time requires corrugated board free of dyes and a book cart with side panels. A piece of the board is inserted between each cover and the text block of each book. There should also be a piece separating each book. If the thickness of the book will allow it, also insert a piece or two as interleaving in the text block. This technique requires a much stronger airflow directly on the books. It's a slow process and it requires changing the board twice a day, but it gives a very satisfactory result in the end. Loose leaf documents, photos printed on paper, and large objects such as maps and posters can become extremely weak after prolonged exposure to water. Those that are extremely weak will sometimes require being lifted with a support sheet on top of the damaged document. The attraction of water to polyester film allows us to safely remove the document from the others. For very fragile materials, a controlled drying process is recommended. Using layers of absorbent paper, then polyester web, the document, another layer of polyester web, and more blotter paper allows us to make a stack of documents for drying. Putting a board with a light weight on top of the stack will give a nice flat result. For stronger documents, you can let them dry in groups or stacks and then separate them after they have dried more. Photographs on paper supports should be dried flat. Those with the gelatin coating may stick together in a water situation as they start to dry. Don't force them apart if they resist. Consult a photograph conservator if in doubt. Film-based materials, microfilm, microfiche, slides, may have to be washed professionally after a damaging event. If possible, keep them in a container of cold purified water or keep them refrigerated for a better result in recovery. Rolled materials will be weaker when wet. Put them aside and don't try to unroll them until dry. Remember that enclosures, originally installed to protect their contents, can become enemies of the items within because they trap water inside and don't allow the drying process to proceed. This can lead to mold outbreak. It is advisable to carefully remove the objects from their wet enclosures. Remember, however, that there may be important identifying information on the enclosure, so make sure you keep that alongside the item. The steps we have just seen have helped us over the years to recover our water damage collections. We are always interested in learning new techniques, in sharing our experience, and in hearing from you too. If you have a question for us or wish to share your information, please contact us at anro at loc.gov and alha at loc.gov. You can also contact us through our website, www.loc.gov slash preservation, and click on the Ask a Librarian feature. We hope you never have to salvage collections, but if you do, we hope that this information will lead to a successful result. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Great case study Visit about teamwork. Uh, this project involved city, local government, regional government, state government, federal government, and private developers all working together in a coordinated manner. Mark Green, the, um, the city manager that we first started with, um, uh, Mark had a lot of vision and he realized or, or felt that this development was going to be key to future development in the city and, and so Mark was really very open to trying to find creative ways to make this project work. And then when Steve Buck came on board, really followed up with, with all the things that, that Mark initiated. So it, it was a positive experience. Well, the Phoenix Award is a, is a national award presented at the, at the National Brownfields Conference uh, each year. And uh, I think the things that really made this project stand out in that competition were the way that the project team was able to persevere through that economic downturn and also the political courage, I think, that the town showed early on. The town uh, made a fairly bold move by taking ownership of this derelict property and uh, was then able to gradually pull together from various funding sources uh, the funding needed to get the cleanup done to a certain point, at which time the property could then be turned over to the private developer who completed the remainder of the cleanup and then went into the redevelopment phase. You know, the nice thing about the mill is you've got a restaurant that we go and have lunch and sit out and say this is pretty cool and then we walk outside and 
see a park that we you know had a, a small part in helping create and, and just the general vibrance and, and you know energy that's that's brought, been brought to that part of town is gratifying this site is really transformed from a real blight in the community to a true asset to the community. Uh, this $12 million redevelopment project was a great success. It provides 36 units of loft style modern housing, as well as uh, about 22,000 square feet of retail space. We invested about one and a half million dollars all told, assessment and cleanup, and the redevelopment ended up being about a $12 million project. So that's almost a, a 10 to one multiplier effect. Which that, that sort of leveraging is a real... From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Once you have your Library of Congress reader identification card, you are ready to begin requesting books and other materials for use in the reading rooms. This video will walk you through the request process step by step. Let's get started by looking at an example. From the Library of Congress homepage, I will navigate to the library catalog. You will notice there are a number of available search options. Today, I will use the quick search, located at the top of the page. After I type in a title, author, or keyword, I will hit enter to continue. Looking through the results, I have found an item I might want to request. So, I will click on the title for more information. If I decide that I would like to request this item, I will click on where to request to determine the item's location and availability. The record indicates that I should request in the Jefferson or Adams Building reading rooms. Since I will be working from the main reading room located in the Jefferson Building, I know that I should be eligible to request this item. Next, I will select Request this item to continue. I will enter my last name and account number as they appear on my reader identification card. Then, I will enter my password and select Login. If this is your first online request, you will need to set up your account by logging in with the default password that the library provided to you. You will then be prompted to create your own password to use for future logins. If you did not receive the default password or you need help logging in, click on Forgot Your Password or Contact Reader Registration for assistance. This is the request form. Under Delivery Location, select the reading room where you would like your item delivered. Please note, not every reading room uses the online request form. Only those reading rooms listed under Delivery Locations allow items to be requested online. When you have finished filling out the request form, select Send Request to continue. If you properly submitted the form, you will receive the following message. Request successful. Once you submit the request, you can expect to wait anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes for the material to be delivered to the reading room. The amount of time for material delivery will vary based on the item's format and location and the access policies of the reading room. Requests for materials that are stored off-site can take up to the next business day. To save time, you may wish to request your items online before you arrive at the library. Materials will be held for 48 hours at the book service desk. If you wish to request items earlier than 48 hours before your arrival, speak with the reference librarian for assistance. And remember, the National Library is your library. We hope to see you soon. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov. Most of us check the weather forecast each morning to see whether we need a coat or an umbrella, or in extreme cases, to stay home. While science has made forecasting storms and weather events more accurate, the weather is still often unpredictable. We can't always accurately predict the weather, but nuclear plant operators and the staff here at the NRC have the experience and the plans to ensure that the nation's nuclear plants remain safe, even when facing hurricanes, tornadoes, heavy rain and floods, and ice and snowstorms. 
Some weather-related events that affected nuclear power plants in the past include Superstorm Sandy in 2012, Hurricane Harvey in 2017, and the March Nor'easter of 2018, which brought heavy snow and tropical storm force winds to the Mid-Atlantic and New England. Nuclear power plants are designed and built taking into consideration the kinds of severe weather expected in the area where they're located. Plants along the coast consider hurricane effects. Plants near rivers and other bodies of water evaluate water intrusion and flooding. Plants in areas with more thunderstorm and tornado activity take into account those events. And plants in colder regions have equipment and plants for dealing with ice, snow, and very cold conditions. Strong structures protect the plant's imported systems from wind damage, flying debris, and other weather-related concerns. And some imported equipment is located higher than areas that may be more flood-prone. The plant's operators and the on-site NRC inspectors are constantly aware of what can happen during severe weather and have detailed plans for what to check for, monitor during, and evaluate after weather events. While there are plans and procedures at nuclear plants for all types of weather, let's look more closely at one particular event, a hurricane. During hurricane season, nuclear plants near the coast or the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the NRC, closely monitor all tropical storms and hurricanes as they develop. If the storm's projected path shows it moving towards the U.S., our regional offices begin tracking it, paying special attention to areas with nuclear plants or other NRC-regulated facilities. If the hurricane looks like it will come ashore, the NRC's preparations intensify. Resident inspectors at nuclear sites near the projected path begin checking the plant's preparations, which may include the plant staff securing items that could be blown by high winds, checking imported emergency equipment such as diesel generators, and ensuring adequate supplies are on site if roads and bridges are blocked or damaged. Additional NRC inspectors may also be dispatched to nuclear plant sites that might be affected. About two days before expected hurricane force winds, NRC officials travel to state emergency operations centers to be in position before the storm hits. Key emergency personnel in the regional office and headquarters are also placed on call. All the nuclear facilities potentially in the hurricane's path provide the NRC continual updates and the on-site inspectors monitor the plant staff's actions. Nuclear plants are built to withstand the expected storms in their area, and actual hurricanes have shown that plants can safely shut down and survive even extremely powerful storms with little or no damage to imported safety equipment. Even so, the NRC establishes communications with state and federal emergency response agencies, including the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, just in case protective actions for local residents are needed. The NRC stays in contact with the plant staff and the NRC inspectors on site as the storm passes using either normal communication channels or the NRC's backup emergency systems. As a hurricane approaches, the plant's operators may shut the plant down based on expected wind speeds. After the storm passes, the NRC helps assess the damage to the facility and works with other agencies such as FEMA to make sure local emergency response organizations are recovered enough to resume their normal response capabilities or any event at the nuclear plant. If the plant shut down, it will only be restarted after the NRC is satisfied no safety equipment is damaged and emergency response resources have been restored. Other severe weather conditions experienced by nuclear plants may provide less advanced warning than a hurricane, and the preparations may not be as extensive, but all the plant's operators have plans in place and have shown in real events that they can respond. NRC inspectors look at the equipment and evaluate those plans, and the NRC license requirements for control room operators include testing their response to unexpected conditions, including severe weather. Fortunately, very few storms and other weather events directly impact nuclear plants and other NRC-regulated facilities, but a combination of preparation and experience means the NRC and the nuclear power plants we regulate are ready, no matter what the weather may bring.